It's so great to see you all here. Um, I just, I just wanted to just run through the latest information about who's in Guantanamo because the facts and figures at the end of the film are a little bit out of date. President Obama did manage to release some of the men from when that film was completed two years ago to now, but there are 171 men still in Guantanamo. And the thing that, um, that has been really gnawing away at all of us who've been campaigning on, the, on this front is that the most obvious injustice, and you know, I, I, the whole place, injustice permeates every aspect of it. But the most obvious injustice that gnaws away at us is that 89 of those 171 men who are still held um, have been uh, approved to transfer out of Guantanamo by an interagency task force established by the Obama administration, and yet they're all still held. Um, and, and really, the kind of the, the driving thing of, of the new campaign and website that Tom and I have been involved in establishing, and that other lawyers are involved in. Um, and that people that have been signing up to support us as we launch this today, people like, like um, Larry Wilkerson, the former Chief of Staff to Colin Powell. Uh, we have retired admirals and generals and judges um, and, and, and a number of, of Guantanamo attorneys who've, who've worked on the cases for the last 10 years. Um, is is to, to get this information out. This is a room of people who who are well informed, and I'm sure that even tonight what people tell me, even people who are well informed tell me that they learn things from watching this film that they didn't know about Guantanamo. And the important thing that we need to know now and that we need to tell to people when we see them is over half of the guys still in Guantanamo the US government doesn't want to hold. Why are they still there? And they're there because of failures on the part of the Obama administration to act uh, when it could have, because of obstruction by Congress, and, um, and in the cases of prisoners who have won their habeas corpus petitions in the courts, because the judges of the DC Circuit Court have been pushing back on the rules of, of detention so that no prisoner can now leave Guantanamo by any legal means. And that's why tomorrow is an important day, because we all need to know no one is leaving Guantanamo until we push for it. There are, it's not as though they're just waiting for an opportunity. Anybody's waiting for an opportunity to free a whole load of people. That's simply not the case. No one is scheduled to leave. Um, and the only way that, that it's going to happen is by us educating other people, people who aren't here tonight, going away and telling our friends. And, and enabling people to understand that it's important. That the National Defense Authorization Act that people have been getting upset about because understandably, the lawmakers of this nation have said we want to we want mandatory military custody for terror suspects for anyone that we allege is connected with Al Qaeda, whether they're foreign or whether they're U.S. citizens. We want to do that. The only way that they were able to justify that to themselves in the first place was because of what's been happening at Guantanamo for ten years, because that's the treatment that foreigners at Guantanamo have been subjected to that the US government 10 years ago decided that it could throw people in a black hole and throw away the key. Exactly the reason that nearly 800 years ago, the nobles of England rose up against King John and, and, and made him sign Magna Carta and began the process whereby habeas corpus was instituted. It began with the nobles. As the centuries went on, it applied to all of us. And it's our only protection against tyranny. And it's something that the, the lawmakers of this country felt that they were justified in doing away with just, just a few weeks ago. And it is all based on what's been happening for the last 10 years, and the root of it all can be found in Guantanamo. So um, I'd like to turn it over to questioning, but I think, first of all, I'd like to ask, um, I don't want to exclude you, Tom, if you want to say something there, but um, this is Daryl Kilmer and Marie Newman, who, who are here from Denver. Um, and they're here for the event tomorrow, and they represent five Yemeni prisoners in Guantanamo. And I'm hoping that I can hand the mic to you guys now, and you'll be able to tell people here a little bit about the guys that you represent. And I'm very excited to have the opportunity for this to happen, because you're in a unique position. The attorneys, are, you're the only people who get to meet the prisoners, and to, to bring their stories to us is, I think, hugely important. So thanks.
enough to support this, uh, these activities of the next couple of days. And I'm certain that I can send you the thanks from our clients down in Guantanamo Bay, our five clients that are all Yemeni men who have been in prison now for coming up on 10 years. Uh, they have told us from the outset of us meeting them that the only way that this problem would be solved, which they detected from the outset was a political rather than a legal problem, is through constant <laughs> attention and public pressure on the various political administrations that make the decisions. Uh, Mari and I uh, work at a very small civil rights law firm in Denver, Colorado, and uh, when it dawned on us back in 2005 and 2006 that this Guantanamo regime was taking hold and had a momentum that seemed to be at the time unstoppable, uh, we figured we're civil rights lawyers, we have to do something about this. This is this is crazy. I mean, it was obvious uh, upon a modicum of, of analysis that this was not legal, at least obvious to us. But it was immediately obvious that this is a pretty overwhelming task. What can some lawyers in Denver, Colorado do to stop this, this momentum that had developed? And we didn't have the answer to that, obviously. We, to this day, don't have the answer to that. But we had to do something. And we contacted the organization called uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, most of you are probably familiar with them, uh, awesome organization, and said, we need to have, we need to help, we need to have some clients, what can we do? And they, uh, you know, they were almost like uh, delighted that they had some suckers out in Denver that would take some cases, and they said, you want some of these cases? We said, yes. They said, you got cases. We'll give you three cases, uh, detainees from Yemen, uh, and uh, Luck, luck is with you because there's going to be a trip to Yemen that several uh, lawyers from the United States are going to be making it to meet their families and to learn more about the case and you can get in on that. So we did get on in on that. And we uh, accepted the cases of two more guys after that. So we had five Yemenis and we went out to Yemen in 2007 in order to meet their families and to begin our work on the case. We hadn't yet been to Guantanamo Bay at the time. Uh, we met the families, and I have to say, at least coming from the perspective of a, uh, uh, an American lawyer coming from mid-America, we were blown away by the, uh, how nice and how uh, authentic and sincere uh, the people were that we met in Yemen and how helpful that they wanted to be and, and thankful that we were trying what we could do to help uh, their brothers and their fathers and their sons uh, in the predicament that they found themselves in. And when we finally did get to go to Guantanamo later that year, we met our clients. Uh, they were, uh, on the one hand, somewhat untrusting, as the film indicated. It, imagine, if you would, uh, sitting there, having been imprisoned at that time for coming on five years, and then an American lawyer coming in and saying, hi, I'm from the United States, I'd like to help you. you know, there was a uh, understandable amount of distrust going on at that time, but. Uh, frankly, we broke through that pretty well, and I'm going to have Mari talk a little bit about the unique difficulties that she uh, found and uh, being a woman uh, dealing with these new clients in a strange setting, obviously a very oppressive setting. Um, but what struck me then, and I, I'm certain I was way too dismissive at this point, was their uh, fairly <laughs> unanimous certainty that this is a political problem and the legal structure can't help. Now, I am hardwired to not believe that. I'm a lawyer, and the tools that I use in the civil rights context is the law. And I am still, to this day, although I'm a little older and less naive than I was five years ago, convinced that we are a country of laws and not men, and that if you properly apply and stay uh, vigilant and properly apply the law, then you can prevail, no matter what the odds. And this was the same type of speech that I gave them. I said, no, Musab, we can do this. Jalal, this can be done. Please let us help you. We will fight for you in the courts. We will file your petition for habeas corpus. We will we'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Department of Justice. We're right and they're wrong. You do have constitutional rights. And I, I sometimes would detect from them a bemused attitude that this is, I guess nothing can go wrong if we wind these guys up and set them <laughs> loose. So they authorized us to fight for them in the courts, but they have constantly told us, and we've been down 
to the camp over a dozen times, probably 13 or 14 times, and they've constantly told us that you do what you can do in the courts for us, that's okay, but please keep the public aware of what's going on here. Please keep political pressure on the United States government, and in our case, the government of Yemen, and all of the influential political forces, because that is how this problem will be solved. And we've dedicated ourselves to do what we can within our knowledge and abilities to keep that happening. And that, of course, is what this week is all about. And the uh, activities tonight and the activities tomorrow certainly are, uh, going, are, are going to make them very happy. They're very delighted when we tell them that we've supported these types of activities, when we write letters to the editor or op-eds in the newspaper. We even speak at schools, or we just try to spread the word, and that, frankly, is more gratifying to them than the legal work that we've been doing, and for good reason. They were right, and I was wrong. The only progress really that's been made for any of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay is political pressure and diplomatic influence. Nobody's been released because of court proceedings. It's, it's sad to say, it's frustrating because I'm a lawyer and I'm supposed to be able to make progress in, in the courts, especially when we're right. I mean, the evidence is preposterous against these men. It is just, it's classified, I can't get into detail, but I can tell you I've read it. Tom said on, in the film, and so did Clive, they've seen some of the evidence too, and it's just ridiculous. You could not convict somebody in county court in Denver, Colorado on the strength of the evidence that they have against many of these men. And you can tell that to a federal judge who doesn't basically disagree, but still says, I'm not going to take the chance and I'm going to leave the man in prison until something changes. Well, my comments will be brief so I can uh, spend most of the time so you can ask the questions you'd like to ask. But I have to echo Gerald's sentiments. I'm so excited to be here to see all of you because it has become abundantly clear over the course of these years that the legal system is really not the way to get these cases done. Uh, Gerald and I went to trial actually on one of our habeas petitions back in October of 2009. Our client was undoubtedly innocent. Uh, the government's so-called evidence against him was ridiculous. Um, it was the sort of thing that is only held in the secure facility uh, where it can't be seen by public eyes because, because if people saw it, they would just laugh. This is the evidence, it's just ridiculous. And uh, yet, we, yet we lost. It was, um, I mean, it was gut-wrenching. We had no idea it could happen. We uh, actually went into the hearing uh, when the order was to be announced absolutely confident that we would win it because it was so obvious that our client was innocent. And the, uh, the lawyers for the government were unprepared, had no evidence. I mean, it was just a terrible presentation because they had nothing. But I guess they knew what we didn't know, which is they didn't need to have a case. Uh, they were the government lawyers and the judge was going to simply defer to whatever it was they said because as some judges have now admitted publicly, no judge wants to be the one that releases somebody. Uh, and that seems to be where we are now. Those few people who have won their habeas petitions now, those have been overturned in the courts of appeals. Uh, so the legal um, setting has become worse and worse. So to see you all now sitting here actively uh, is very exciting for us. I have to say in Denver it becomes a little bit um, isolated and working in the courts have become somewhat isolated. And to see that there are so many people still actively working in other settings is, uh, is reassuring and gratifying to us sitting here now. And to be able to report back on our next trip to the base when we see uh, our clients and I'll call them our friends too again will be uh, an awfully nice thing to report. So I thank you all for that. I think that uh, since President Obama's executive order, things have really gotten worse in many respects. And that's because many people who are generally speaking in favor of the cause have um, are now misinformed. Either people think, oh, well, it must, have, it must have closed. He said he was closing it. Oh, it's not closed? Oh, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, he must have learned something new that he didn't know when he wasn't the president. Maybe new information is available to him. And having actually seen the evidence, he's come to a different conclusion. Well, it's not that at all. It's simply having to having succumbed to political pressures, um, which he apparently was not uh, as vulnerable to on the campaign trail. But I want to uh, reassure everybody sitting here and anybody else who will listen, having seen the so-called evidence about against our clients, it's certainly not the evidence that keeps them there. It's, uh, it's political. So I'm glad you're all here. 
And I guess with that, I'll just open it to questions so you all can hear what you want to. Let me make a, a, a few comments. Um, <laughs> I'm, I think some of the problems are even a little more subtle than that. I, I, you know, uh, actually, uh, my good friend Daryl, there actually have been people released to, pursuant to court order. There were a lot of habeas cases that were wanted, those people are out. Uh, I think it's absolutely right that a number of judges uh, won't make a decision. If there's any evidence on the side of the government, they go with the government. And the problem is the Court of Appeals now has adopted that. So any evidence introduced by the government is given credence and nothing else can rebut it. So that, that's a tremendous problem. I think, you know, what everybody said here, I look around the room and I see people like Art Laffin, who have devoted so much of his life now to trying to right injustice and have suffered personally because of it. We all see Guantanamo as a, as a, a stain on everything we believe in, everything that makes us proud to be Americans of Guantanamo uh, violates. Uh, it's a, it, it makes me feel ashamed every day and it makes me depressed to see that it goes on. But in times, after I've been in it for 10 years now, almost 10 years, I was a young man and had hair when I started. <laughs> uh, but you think, what is it you can do? Well, what you're doing tomorrow is incredibly important because of the, the pressure. But you know, um, we were in a meeting with Jim Moran today, Congressman Moran, who was terribly frustrated. And he said, look what happens. He said, the fact is, let's face it, most Americans think that the people at Guantanamo are bad people, and we need to do something about them. Most of them think this is necessary. Most of them would, you know, uh, would double the size of Guantanamo. Indeed, the likely Republican candidate has said, if I'm in office, I'm going to double the size of Guantanamo, and people cheer them. Uh, so what could, there's a very subtle issue. What can we do about this? Uh, some people I know say, well, don't criticize President Obama about this because I don't want Romney to win. I, I don't come down that way. I, I think that the pressure that you're bringing tomorrow, that we're all going to try to bring, is terribly <laughs> important, and it's very important to hold President Obama's feet to the fire. Amen. Um, and there is something today, I, I will tell you, it's, it's, it's so important. The National Defense Authorization Act, which everybody thinks is a horrible bill, and it is a horrible bill, it allows any one of us to actually be arrested, arrested on uh, suspicion of terrorism and to be held in military prison indefinitely. It's extraordinary. But what's sort of hidden in the bill, it actually does make it easier to transfer people out of Guantanamo. And now the president has the authority to grant a waiver to do it. He has the authority, all he needs is the guts. And it's very important for us to call on him to exercise that authority to release people. I, the fact is not known, and, and you know, often we are perceived as left-wing radicals and, and we're marginalized. That's, we've also got to reach out to the other side, the broad brush of America, to remind them what American principles are and to tell them what the facts are. I mean, the facts, as Andy said, are that of the 171 people at Guantanamo, 89 of them have been cleared, cleared by an interagency task force. How many of your friends or neighbors know that? You've got to, you know, the lie of Guantanamo only exists in the absence of the truth. We've got to do something to get the truth out there and tell people about that and to really push President Obama. I mean, we're not going to convince some Republican congressman in Mississippi to change his mind. But it seems to me that with the pressure, we could convince President Obama again that what succeeded for him in the last campaign, not running away from this issue, not saying, oh, I'm not going to take it on because it threatens our security, but to forthrightly say that our principles are consistent with our security. You don't need to choose one or the other. We're a stronger nation if we hold to our principles. And we've got to hold them to that, and that's, that's what you're doing tomorrow. And last thing, um, this website that Andy talked about is terribly important. Close Guantanamo, 
uh, org, which is on here. And as part of that, we're putting together a petition to the White House. If we get 250,000 signatures, they need to answer it. And that's pressure on them. So please, go out, sign up for this website, sign up for the White House petition, ask every friend and relative you know to do it too. That's how I think eventually we could turn this around. I hope so, because I'm getting pretty old. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I'd like to take um, questions from the audience now, but just to just to mention um, that it's 25,000 signatures on the White House. Oh, 25,000. Um, but 250,000, I think, I think we need to aim for. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to aim high. We need to ask every American who cares to call this to an end after 10 years. So, can we go to okay. questions? Yeah. Well, what is this 25,000 limit you refer to? Um, that, can I ask the second part too? If, if until the base is closed, the prison is closed, is there anything that could be done to open it that would be helpful, like to their families, or open it in any other way to the reporters open it? You know, I don't know. When we started out, um, it's very hard to have the courts. Um, take action on the rules and procedures, security rules and procedures in a military base. We tried it initially, and even the courts who were sympathetic to us felt that they were reaching over the line. This is, it is a naval base controlled by the Navy with all these things. They felt they were intruding in that. Really, when we run, won the right to habeas corpus, they distinguished the right to habeas corpus from the rules and regulations in a military base. They said this is a traditional judicial function to require a fair hearing for anyone detained. Some of them have not been so fair as you say that, but that was, it's very tough. And the 25,000 is, there's a We the People petitions on the White House website, um, which if you reach the 25,000 target, um, you, you will get an answer to, to your petition, and the petition is to um, ask the president to, well, to, to request the closure of Guantanamo. Um, now, I'm sure the president is not going to turn around and say, oh yeah, actually, you're right, we, we hadn't thought about that. But the purpose this year, with the petition and with the website, is to build up a, a, as large as a possible a number of people to demonstrate to the president, whichever president, whoever's the next president, to demonstrate to Congress to demonstrate to the judges in the DC Circuit Court, to demonstrate to right-wing pundits, to demonstrate to people who think that it's not worth it, to demonstrate to all these people that what we've actually seen for the last few years, it, 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 when there's been a vacuum, and often there has been a vacuum in terms of, of people with power and responsibility, that vacuum has been filled by right-wingers. That vacuum has been filled by the kind of people who felt that they were justified in saying to the American people, if we think you're a terrorist, we want to throw you in a black hole and throw away the key. We need to take back the conversation, and we need to take back and win the argument. And one way we can do that is to demonstrate that there are many of us, that we aren't just the odd bunch of people who turn up and protest, that there are a lot of people who are prepared to say, uh, we no longer accept what's being done, we demand the closure. So that's really what we're able to do.